Hey everyone, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Andrea Burton. I'm a user experience lead at Funny Monkey here in Portland, Oregon. Um, we are, let me get to the front of my slides. Um, this is Brett Heckman. He's a user experience lead designer at ThinkShout. And we have with us, joining via Skype, this is Kristen Anton. She's the community builder for New Tactics. And we're gonna flip back and forth to hear from Kristen. So this session is uh, looking at the new tactic. It's a case study to look at the new tactics website development. Um, and it's to look at the UX process for, uh, new tactics is a human rights activist website. So I was at Think Shout and I did the user experience process and all of the discovery. Um, I left to go to Funny Monkey and Brett took over. And so he did, he picked up from where I left off on the user experience and he did all the front end theming. Um, this site was in English and Arabic. Uh, there are other languages on this site, but we focused for the first round on English and Arabic. Um, I have a background in developing sites for NGOs in English and Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, I just have worked on a lot of websites that have Arabic on them. I used to work for an organization called Medan based in San Francisco and they do a lot of English Arabic translation on the web. So to start this pre presentation out, um, this is the site that we started with. This is the original New Tactics site. Um, and during a discovery process, we went from this site into wireframing in English. Then we went to wireframing in Arabic. And you'll notice everything switched sides because Arabic is a right to left language. Into a design, into a design in Arabic, and then into mobile wireframes and a mobile design. And so through this talk and my portion of the talk, I'm gonna go through the user experience deliverables, the process that we went through to go from the original site all the way up into the design and implementation. So I'm gonna let Kristen Anton introduce herself now um, and have her introduce new tactics, what, what their mission is, what their website needs were when they came to Think Shout, and Kristen's role at New Tactics. So let me pull her up. Go for it, Kristen. Thanks, Andrea. So New Tactics and Human Rights is a program of the Center for Victims of Torture, which is an organization based in Minnesota. I'm actually in New York, so that made us have to figure out time zones in at least three different time zones at this point, Oregon, Minnesota, New York. Um, we help human rights defenders work more effectively so that they can achieve their goals and better address human rights violations around the world. And we do this by documenting and disseminating innovative human rights tactics. We do training and mentoring for activists on strategic thinking, and we build an online community of activists around the world to share their experiences and knowledge with each other. And in 2011, we received funding to create a regional hub in the Middle East and North Africa region. This hub was meant to provide resources, training, and community to activists in the region. And in order to make this work, we knew that we needed a new website. So we went to ThinkShout uh, knowing that we needed a, an Arabic version of our website, which included all of our online community features. Um, we knew that we needed a mobile-friendly website and a low-bandwidth design. Uh, we knew that a lot of our users in that region would be uh, accessing our resources through their phones, and we also knew that some of them didn't have very good bandwidth. And then we also knew that we just needed an upgrade to Drupal 7, that this was an, our opportunity to get onto the next version of Drupal. And so my role with New Tactics is as the online community builder. I'm also the administrator of the website. I manage all the content and all the communications. And I managed this web development process from our end at New Tactics. And I've managed our website for years. Uh, I moved it from Drupal 5 to Drupal 6, and now we moved to Drupal 7. So I knew quite a bit about Drupal. 
but this was actually my first time participating in a discovery process, which Andrea will talk more about. And um, we were basically going to Think Shout to build the site from the ground up. So to just to start from scratch and build what we needed. And even though I hadn't done it before, it was a really eye-opening experience and I learned a lot. So I'll hand it over to you, Andrea. Cool, thanks. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to start talking about is the project challenges. So Kristen came to us, and they had gotten funding. Um, I've worked on English Arabic websites before, and I know from experience it's really helpful to get as much user experience, research, data um, collected so that we know exactly what we're building. Um, so there was a fixed budget for this project. So I had to a little bit secretly try to get in as much user, as many user experience deliverables as I could, so I could really understand who the users were and what they wanted exactly. Um, the other thing is that the stakeholders were across multiple time zones. Um, we're we're in Portland, uh, like Kristen said. You know, New Tactics and the Center for Victims of Torture, which is the parent organization. They're in uh, Minnesota. Kristen's in New York. And then we also had a team in the Middle East in Jordan. So we had a span of, I think it's nine or 10 hours. So there were many times that I was like on 6 a.m. calls um, with Jordan uh, to do stakeholder interviews. And then defining the exact multilingual needs and preparing the translated content. Um, for those of you who have never worked on a multilingual site, the first thing, you, and I'll talk about this later in content strategy, the first thing you have to do is figure out what your content is and start getting it translated because that takes a long time. Um, because you have many people uh, in the role, you have, you have to you know, communicate with the translator, figure out what your content is in English first, get that translated, make sure it comes back. Um, but also figuring out exactly what the users need who are speaking different languages. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this further. You know, Drupal 7 deals with multilingual in a few different ways. We, t we took a lot of time figuring out, do we want to do you know, node-based translation where the, the nodes uh, correspond to each other? In Drupal 7, you can do entity-based translation. I won't go too technical, but that's field-level translation. For this project, we decided to go with a field-level translation. Um, s to prepare new tactics for the future so they could add more languages. Um, in my user experience process, I always start out with the objective, or um, at ThinkShout, we, we called it desired outcomes. Um, so what I do is I start with a stakeholder call. I get everybody on the phone, and we just go through and we talk about you know, we talk about objectives, we talk about target audience or personas, and we talk about what those users, those personas, what their motivations are on the site. Um, and Kristen was a really great person to work with. She was a client that gave a lot of good feedback, and so we worked together to develop these. We had a lot of um, secondary objectives, but these were our main ones. Um, the first was to create a global community of human rights practitioners and organizations um, that need a website to come to to share these tactics. Now what tactics are, and this took me a while uh, while I was doing the research, tactics are basically um, actions or tools that, that human rights activists have used uh, in the past to get their message out to uh, the people that they're you know, trying to educate. Um, the other thing that we really wanted to do was have new tactics be, be the online go-to resource for human rights activists. There's a few other sites out there, but we wanted to give it a new look and feel to make it really inviting to human rights activists that didn't know about new tactics um, to come there and just be like, this is the place for for my tactics. And then the other main goal, because the funding was coming to build specifically this hub for Middle East, North African users, 
human rights practitioners, we needed to create an Arabic site to enable uh, activists in the MENA region to be more effective in their human rights work. The next thing we did was we identified the target audience or the personas. Our main target audience was the human rights practitioners as a whole. Um, and mostly we were gearing it, we figured out in research and talking to stakeholders and interviews that we really want to go for experienced human rights practitioners. Those are the people who are actually going to get on the site, download resources, participate in conversations. Um, and with those experienced practitioners on the site, they're also going to pull new practitioners in. Um, other practitioners that fall under the human rights practitioners umbrella is experienced practitioners. Um, new tactics, they do trainings all over the world. So practitioners that have participated in the trainings, practitioners that will participate. Um, and then the other users you always have to consider are the people who are going to be adding the content, which is the new tactics staff, and the funders. The funders, this is an important lesson I've really learned in the last few years. Part, part of the website is to show the funders that their money is going to a good place and it's actually working. Um, so it's always good to keep the funders in mind. They're not, you know, the number one user persona, but we do need to make sure that our website's successful. Then to create empathy, I like to come up with examples of these human rights practitioners. And so this is just a list of different practitioners that the New Tactics website um, serves. You know, and I've worked with some of these NGOs. You know, I'm friends with Social Media Exchange in Beirut. So while I'm like building features, designing this, I can think, okay, my friend Jessica in Beirut, she's going to need to get on the site. She speaks English. She speaks a little bit of Arabic. You know, how how is she going to walk through this? Um, so that's why I like to come up with examples to increase the empathy. And then once I have the target audience. I like to really understand what is their motivation. That specifically helps me define what features are the most important and be able to prioritize those features. Um, we came up with a lot of uh, motivations, but I, 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 for this presentation, I just wanted to show these three. Um, that human rights practitioners, they want to collaborate and coordinate with other practitioners. They want a space to reflect on their, weir uh, their work with their peers. And they, um, when they're implementing a campaign, if they've been using the same tactics you know, for their whole career, they want to look for new tactics to, and strategies to apply. So because of the fixed budget and it was limited, I was not able to do like, you know, I would have preferred to like, you know, interview at least five different practitioners of different types, practitioners in the Middle East, um, practitioners in other places in the world. But since I didn't have the budget for that, um, I went ahead and did surveys using SurveyMonkey. It was a way to get, you know, just numbers to look at so I could make some decisions off of this. I went with SurveyMonkey because it supported Arabic. Um, other, you know, I looked at like a Drupal form and other stuff like that, but this was the, the quickest thing out of the box that, that supported Arabic. Um, I'm just showing one question that uh, I, I, that we posed. You know, what kind of internet connection do you have for the device you would most likely use to access an online community of human rights practitioners? And you'll see the numbers aren't huge here. I, I ten people answered this question, but it, still, it gave me a little bit of a sense of who who we're gearing towards. Um, and you know, these are English speakers, not necessarily all, um, you know, from the states. So. But you know, we can see that everybody's getting connected through high speed. But when we look at the Middle East and the Arabic survey, we can see that we, we still have some people on dial-up. And so that was definitely something to consider. Also, they're connected through high speed USB dongle. I've been to the Middle East. I've used those high speed USB dongles. And uh, I just know from personal experience, they don't always work that great. So it's good to know that I, these are the people I'm supporting. The next thing I did, and I, I feel like this is one of the most important user experience deliverables, um, is user experience mapping. So what that means is I, I create personas based off of um, our target audience. 
And what I really like to do is come up with names for them and a personality for them, you know, and like somebody's 40 years old and they work part-time at a grassroots human rights organization. They are able, only able to get on to the internet from 8 to 10 p.m. after they put their kids to bed. Okay, when are they getting on the internet? So, or when are they getting on the New Tactics website? To do this stakeholder call, this was one of those 6 a.m. meetings. We used GoTo, GoToMeeting. Uh, I really like this tool because I was able to screen share. I, put, I use OmniGraffle. I screen shared OmniGraffle, and then as they were talking to me, I just typed up the notes. I was moving these blocks around. Um, and you, it's hard to see here, but so the navy blue box is, that is the, uh, that's the user I'm walking through. I'm saying, where are they getting to this site? They're coming from uh, mostly social media sites. That's because Kristen is posting new tactics that show up on the site, on Facebook, on Twitter. That's where these um, human rights practitioners are seeing that. They're linking to that. Okay, where do they go from there? And so they might you know, participate in a conversation. They might read a case study. Um, and then I like to say, okay, well, how long are they gonna stay on the site? Where are they gonna leave from? And what this actually helps, uh, helps do is, so, I've done this so many times where we're like, we need to have live chat, we need to have all these videos on there, and we need to you know, have a discussion forum and all of these things, but this helps us really focus on what features are people actually gonna use. They want to look at their tactic. They want to participate in a conversation. They're not going to hang out and have a live chat at 9 p.m. because people are all over the world. Uh, who's going to be online then? So it allows us to cut out extraneous features. The next thing I do, based on all of the research that I've collected at this point, um, is create a sitemap. This is just a small uh, screen a screenshot of a tiny part of one part of the of the new tactics website. So I use the sitemap to define the landing pages, where they're going to navigate to from those landing pages, what content is going to be on those pages. Um, just a small summary, and I'll take that further on. And then you know iterative parts of the site. So like uh, you know if we have 200 tactics on this site. Um, you know, from the example of tactics page, you'll go into the individual tactics page. So based on the sitemap, um, we then define the content strategy. Now, this whole, this whole DrupalCon, we're talking a lot about content strategy. I'm a little obsessed with content strategy. I find, I've been working on websites for 10 years. I find that most websites, the, the pain point the potential failure point is getting the content in. And when I started working on the web, we, we would just say, oh, we'll build the site, you have to have all the content written, and the site won't go live until it does. Well, I've, I've worked on sites that don't go live for six months after we're finished because the content isn't written. So what I do for clients is create a content matrix document. I, I use a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet. Um, the fields are the page name, the URL, and this, this uh, for the new tactic site, it's the language that that piece of content's gonna be in. What sidebar blocks are gonna be on that page? What content area blocks are gonna be on that page? Are we gonna have images? Are we gonna have video? Any other media, files? And then any notes that, you know, if you have multiple content editors working on this, you can put notes in uh, to figure out where you're at. Um, so I created a content matrix document for Kristen. I loaded her up with a lot of content strategy books. Um, I didn't, you know, I, there was no budget for us to, for me to actually sit down with her and really help do a, like a solid content strategy. So we worked together to get, to get this done. The other thing uh, for a multilingual site, so there's two parts of doing multilingual sites. There's localization and then there's actually translation of content. So the localization, what that means is you're translating the navigation links. You're translating save, preview, publish, like anything on the Chrome that needs to be in the different language. Um, 
admin menus, dashboard menus, things like that. So what we did first is we created a translation document for all of those user interface elements. She was able to pass that to her translator and then while we're still you know, developing features and doing the coding, she's already getting that content translated. After that, once we've really developed the content, the content matrix document, she knows everything that's gonna be in the site, then she's able to pass that on to the translator. And I'm gonna let Kristen say a few things about the content strategy. Andrea, when you first asked me if I had a content strategy, <laughs> I remember my response was like, oh, what? <laughs> I had no idea what it was, um, even though I had been managing the site for years, and it's embarrassing to admit it, but it's true. Um, but all the resources that Andrea gave me were super helpful, and I've learned so much, and um, I've really been involved in learning more about it. And although I think that for this first round of web development, I think we started really simple with our content strategy and basically just had this strategy of like, let's figure out how to get our main core resources on the new site in a user-friendly way that makes sense to people and that can be translated easily. and. We've done that, and um, now I can see very clearly how to take that forward. So we're looking forward to the next phase of the project so that we can um, improve the information architecture and the strategy and connecting the content to each other in a, in a more thoughtful way. Um, what else can I say about that? I don't, I remember when you first show, showed me that spreadsheet, that content matrix, and it was totally overwhelming and I don't think I ever actually filled it all out um, but it was useful at the same time to see all the different pieces that I had to actually figure out before we went forward um, and I know that Things Shout kept telling me over and over that creating the content is going to be the hardest part and it's going to take a long time and I really honestly did not believe you guys but it is so true I had no idea how many people would have to approve each piece of content and then to get it translated and the whole process took so long. So thankfully we got started on that right away and that was definitely something that I learned. Yeah, and I think one of the learning lessons there, especially with when working on NGO sites, nonprofit sites, one thing, I've gone to a few content strategy sessions here at DrupalCon and it's, we need to, uh, empower nonprofits to know to ask for a like a content strategy budget, like a line item in the budget. And I think we also um, need to understand that, like, you know, Kristen wears a lot of hats at New Tactics. She maintains the site. She wrote a lot of the content, and like figuring out how to support that. I don't necessarily have the answers, but it's like creating. But one potential is creating budget to actually have a writer come on board. Um, and if we did that, that actually. Yeah, if that's possible, okay. if there's money to do it, and I know that there's always limits, but um, I just think it's. It's telling the right story and, and actually getting the content written because I can do as much user research and user experience and make as many um, suggestions as features, but it's like if we're not telling the right story with the right words, it's not going to work. And I mean, with websites, we do the best we can. And, and I think, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll step forward and show you the design that we came up with. And I think we're doing a good job. So that's, I'm gonna segue out of content strategy and back to the slides. So the next thing I'm just gonna quickly touch on the wireframes. We chose to use Axure for the wireframes. Um, we did this because Axure actually supported Arabic. I could, a lot of times with Arabic, it's really hard to cut and paste into certain programs um, because of the characters. But with Axure, I was able to do that. I also chose Axure because it allowed you to create mobile clickable wireframes and also desktop clickable wireframes. You can do like different devices. Um, 
And so I'll just walk you through some of these wireframes. We actually went through and did English wireframes, Arabic wireframes um, for the home page, and then we also did a mobile Arabic and English. Just because also during the survey, we found that a lot of the Arabic users, um, they're, they're doing a lot of their reading uh, on mobile. So, you know, here, th these were all clickable. We had like a URL to it so that new tactics and our developers could click through. Um, you know, one thing that was really important is that we ne actually needed to define what new tactics was when people came to the site. So I really just wanted to have a big headline that said, this is who we are. We are a community of human rights activists. And then one another thing that we found is like, People just were really confused about what to do when they got there. So we have a, you know, a get started right away. And then because a lot of the funding for this redesign was coming um, to support the, you know, the Middle East North African hub, I wanted to, boom, have Arabic immediately on the page where you could see it and announcing the, the MENA hub. This is what it looked like in Arabic. Um, it just was really helpful to do it in Arabic. It's helpful for the client who you know, hasn't done an Arabic-specific site to see this is how it's going to look like. It's helpful for the translators to know what they're going to work on. And then this is just screenshots of uh, what it looks like on the mobile. And um, you know, so we, we, did, uh, yeah, we did this in mobile. And then actually, I don't know if we did an Arabic mobile wireframe, but um, anyway. The next uh, deliverable I really like to do is style tiles. Um, what are style tiles? You know, style tiles are something that have been around a long time. Samantha Warren, who used to be a designer at Phase 2 and now is a designer with Twitter, she made them really popular um, a few years ago. So a style tile is a design deliverable that references web face uh, interface elements through font, color, style collections. Um, and so it's, instead of doing a whole mock-up of the design, I did three different mock-ups to define different colors, different type treatments, um, different styles. So this was one with one specific color palette and specific fonts, button styles. And then here, I'm just, I'm just doing really quick elements uh, design elements. The next one is similar, but we've got a gradient. We've got some more textures in there, and these styles are different. We've got a, a, a serif font instead of two sans serif fonts. And then we did one in Arabic. Uh, you know, we've got rounded corners here, but just, just to show like what the Arabic's going to look like, what Arabic fonts are we going to choose. And right around this time, uh, Google web, f web fonts uh, put out um, Arabic web fonts, and they also have they have a ton. It's they're still in experimental web fonts, but you can still use them. So that was the web fonts I chose to go with. Um, so now I'm just going to go to Kristen's feedback of the UX process. Do you want to go into that? Yeah, just briefly. Um, I, I think that the biggest reflection, hopefully useful reflection um, that I have as you are going through those slides um, is that as a nonprofit and a human rights organization, we want to do everything. And when we came to Things Shout, we had like this huge, big, beautiful idea of what we wanted for our website. And we wanted our users to be able to participate in the conversations through their email. And we wanted all kinds of crazy stuff. And you guys did a great job of um, helping us to narrow down what we needed, but I think that it it uh, showed itself through every step of the process. It, when you were trying to get us to identify our goals, when you were trying to get us to identify the user motivations, the audiences, we came up with like 30 things for every question that you asked us, when really what I think you wanted was like one to three. Uh, you know, definite answers. And that was a huge struggle for us. I don't think we knew, we didn't know what we wanted and we didn't know the answers to these questions. So it was, it was a process for us. And um, I guess that's just a word of advice for future um, designers as you're working with nonprofits is like, 
some way to really whittle it down and make it clear that um, having just a couple goals is more useful than coming up with 20. Because if you have 20 goals, how do you know you're going to actually reach them? And then just the other piece, um, something that I wish that I had coming out of this uh, discovery process is something that clearly states uh, what our goals were, what came out of the user research, and then the decisions that we made for the features. So that, it, you know, even some kind of like table that would clearly show like this goes to this, goes to this, so that I can go back to that document in two years and say, the reason why we chose that font is because of this. And the reason why we have that block over there is because of this. Remember, we put all that thought into it. But um, besides that, it was a really useful process. Excellent. Thanks for that feedback. Um, pull up the slides here, and I'm about to pass it over to Brett. Uh, this, and then this, this slide right here, this is the final design based off of all of our research, all of our wireframes, and um, the style tiles, choosing the colors. This is what we ended up going with. And then I left ThinkShout, and Brett came on, and so he took everything that I had, and he then went in to build the theme. So we passed the baton off. <laughs> I need to raise the mic. So I'm Brett, and I'm the current um, user experience engineer at ThinkShout. And uh, as Andrea said, I inherited this, this, uh, this project. Um, when the idea of this session was first proposed, I wasn't really sure that I really had um, much, much to add um, of, of much value. But after r some reflection, um, it occurred to me occurred to me that there there were some really valuable lessons um, that I learned or or relearned um, throughout the process. Um, some more in the vein of relationship management, and and others um, more practical tips coming from someone who had never executed a uh, theme with. A, that required right to left support. So the first big hurdle for me was uh, I'm not Andrea Burton. Um, there was a ton of work, as, as we just saw, um, that, that went into the discovery process. Um, a lot of conversation and discussions that even the most detailed uh, discovery documentation can't capture all of the nuances of. Um, and so the issue for me was, you know, day to day in my role at ThinkShout currently, I, I rely on the, a lot of the same methods that, that, uh, that Andrea used in this project um, to, to figure out objectives, organizational goals. Um, and, you know, the the primary, the primary objective from a logistical perspective is to arrive at documentation that provides a, a, a roadmap for, for implementation. Um, but almost of equal importance, I've learned, is that it's, it's, it's a wonderful platform um, to, to begin building uh, trust. And so the the first hurdle that, that uh, and the first challenge that I was faced, to, faced with in this project was um, how to inject myself, um, given where the project was at this point, um, and um, how to start that relationship with, with Kristen. Um, because there was still plenty of design decisions um, and user experience work to do as, as uh, implementation progressed. Um, and 
if I've learned anything over the years of doing this, um, it's that trust is absolutely essential. It's the one thing that stands between a project that's um, moving forward efficiently um, towards success and one that's, um, that's, you know, just there's a time drain um, going on. So the first thing that I did was um, obviously I, I reviewed um, all of the discovery documentation that Andrea put together, um, and it was immensely helpful. Um, and what I was looking for was um, just that any opportunity where I could um, add value. Um, so I was really looking for a small win. Um, and what I chose to focus on was just an initial pass at the theme. Um, taking the work that was indicated in the, the style tiles and the wireframes. Um, what's, what I've learned is so great about these, these two deliverables is that what you arrive at after putting those in place is essentially just an underpainting. The other, the other thing I had to remind myself was um, I can't be afraid to ask questions. Um, I know that Kristen didn't expect that I would, um, that, that we would have just been able to transfer all of the knowledge that was inside of Andrea's head when she was leaving the project. Um, um, at the same time, I didn't, um, I didn't want to ask stupid questions. Um, I wanted to be sure that I was, that I had properly reviewed all the discovery documentation. And the other thing that was really difficult for me is that something that I enjoy about the discovery process is that, you know, when, it, when you first begin, it's, it's all about these big ideas and, and, and then, um, gradually becoming more and more focused um, based on what you learn. Um, and so I really had to, to leave that uh, role behind because at this point the, the minimum viable product uh, features had been defined um, and implementation had begun. Uh, so some features were complete uh, and others, the finer details about how they were actually going to be executed were still being defined and worked through uh, with the developers. So you end up serving more as a guide, um, and as those uh, implementation uh, issues come up and arise, you, you help to sort of navigate and find, find the solutions. Um, so now I'm going to move into just a, a real brief um, overview of uh, adding right to left support to a theme. Um, uh, Drupal does uh, a lot of the heavy lifting for you if you've got the contrib modules um, that are necessary in play. Um, if you don't have a, th if you're working with a, th a theme and you want to add right to left support, um, and it doesn't currently support that, um, you can take a look at um, inside of the, the root directory, the modules slash systems um, HTML template. Um, and what you'll see there is that Drupal is setting some language specific uh, variables for you. For this site, we use the Zen theme. And Specifically in Zen, um, what they do, you can find in template.php, is set these, uh, set these uh, language and um, direction variables. And then if you look inside the, the, the layout, that won't necessarily be in your, your theme if you use the starter kit, um, unless you have some reason to override that HTML template. Um, but if you look inside uh, the, the base Zen theme, uh, you'll see um, that at the top of the page, um, in the, the beginning HTML tag, that's where they're printing um, the uh, HTML attributes um, variable that we set in template.php. 
And then the result, if you want to take a look in Firebug, is basically the printing of, um, you know, language English, direction left to right, versus language Arabic, direction right to left. From there, it's really just a matter of naming conventions in your style sheets. So uh, take foo stylesheet.css, add a dash RTL to it. Um, this works in a cascading style, uh, cascading way. So uh, the stylesheet.css will be loaded first, um, and uh, stylesheet dot RTL, dash RTL, will be loaded second. Um, so it's that, that latter, uh, the last style sheet is really just for overrides, specific to the right to left version. Um, another great uh, trick that I learned along the way was that um, using Zen grids, which is not necessarily only possible using the Zen theme. It's just a, a grid, a grid framework um, that could really work with any theme. Um, he's got this really great um, function called Zen reverse all floats um, that's provided in the right to left theme uh, style sheet. Um, once you set that to true um, and uh, import the the, the standard left to right layout, um, all of the floats will automatically be, be reversed. The only other best practice that I can recommend is that, um, and this is, was learned the hard way, is that commenting your code when it's uh, padding or margin um, or float styling specific to a particular language direction is absolutely essential unless you want to really go back and have to pick through your theme with a um, fine tooth comb to, to find all those language specific um, styles. So now we're going to go into just lessons learned. Um, I'm going to let Kristen talk about some things that she learned and then Brett and I will add anything that we haven't added yet. <laughs> so over to you, Kristen. Okay. Um, I just have a couple things and maybe you all will have some good questions about our experience building this. Um, but there were a lot of tiny little frustrations when dealing with um, Drupal and Arabic. Um, one very small example is that the autocomplete fields on the back end of nodes, um, you have to put your cursor in the field in Arabic, and then you have to use the arrow key to get the cursor to just the right place, and then you can start typing. And it's just not logical at all where you're supposed to put the cursor, and it takes a lot of trial and error. And then you can start typing, and then the Drupal will pick up on what it thinks you're typing. And this has been a big challenge for us because it just means that it's a lot more difficult for my staff to learn how to use these things that are supposed to be pretty simple in Drupal as a content management system. Um, something that is a really big frustration with Arabic is that um, currently you can't search our Arabic site in Arabic. It turns out, or it seems that uh, Drupal core the search in Drupal core doesn't support Arabic. So we're going to have to completely redo that, um, which is really frustrating. And a lot of these things, we just had no idea that you know this was going to be a problem. And then for myself, um, I've been an administrator of a Drupal site for years. And walking into this role of becoming an administrator for an Arabic website, I, wasn't, I really wasn't sure what to expect. And it's been pretty interesting. I've had to add all of the translated content, um, not just the content, but also all the blocks, all the labels, all the buttons, all the menus, the taxonomy terms. Um, and it's tough, because I don't read any Arabic at all. And so it's a lot of guessing and 
um, working with my team in Jordan. And it was hard because I can't just train my staff in Jordan on how to add a translated taxonomy term to a Drupal 7 website. I have to figure it out intimately so that I know exactly which button I'm pushing. And it, it was also a lot of spreadsheets of um, translated terms. So I would just go through page by page of the English site and write down every term and every phrase and then ask our translator in Jordan to translate it all in that spreadsheet. So, And I still have it and I still go back to it all the time. So those are some of the lessons learned and frustrations so far. <laughs> I'm sure there are a million more. And, and for me, some lessons I learned is that like, uh, when I start on a website, like I'm a user experience nerd. I love working on multilingual sites. I've traveled in the Middle East. I've worked with a lot of NGOs in the Middle East. And so, uh, and I work with NGOs specifically because like that's my passion. I wanna see change in the world, all of these things. And I think uh, on this project, I, I just wanted, I wanted to do all of these deliverables we didn't actually have budget for. Um, so I had to I had to sneak them in a little bit, and um, so I I don't know. I guess the lesson is either get more budget ahead of time, or I have to just like calm down and be like I can only do these few things, and you know hope that I get the you know get the features and get that all of what I need. But you know a website's never finished, and uh, it's going to take multiple iterations, and like. We've taken this new tactic site from you know, the old design to the new design, and like Kristen said before, we're still learning lots of lessons. Um, so I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, if there's any questions, you can come to the mic. Well, I could just add one other yeah. thing. Sorry, um, just to tell you guys a little bit about the result, the end product. Oh yeah. Um, the English site was launched in December, and then the Arabic site was launched in February, mostly because of translation holdups. Um, and so far we've hosted two online conversations in Arabic, which is really the main event that we host through the website. Um, and those topics were on the strategic use of social media for human rights. And then the second topic was on monitoring prisons. We had a total of 170 comments for both of those conversations. And it involved about 25 people from, I think about six or seven countries in the region. So it's been really positive. We've had 9,000 visits at least. Um, that was as of like three weeks ago since the launch of the Arabic site. And that's specifically for the Arabic website. Um, and we can also see through our Google Analytics that the, the number of visitors coming to our site that have their browser set to Arabic has increased by 350%, which shouldn't be a surprise. But um, it, I mean, really we've broadened our audience by so much and we are offering so much to people to activists in the Middle East and it feels like there's a lot of momentum and excitement and we're really happy with the response so far cool. any questions so I was wondering um, the um, difficulty that Kristen mentioned uh, about um, Arabic in the um, autocomplete fields. If either of you know if um, that or things like that are being addressed in like the D8 um, translation internationalization initiatives. Maybe you don't, but I thought. I have no idea. Does yeah. anybody else know? <laughs> I, hon I honestly don't know. I'm going to guess that it hasn't been addressed yet. Um, I think, I mean, there's also an issue is that, uh, and I, I faced this at Medan when I was working with Arabic, is that neither Kristen or I speak Arabic. And like, so when I was having to add, you know, translations to different websites, like I do read and speak Hebrew, so I understand like right to left, but, and so I could like recognize the symbols but you have to like change your keyboard. And like I work on a Mac, so you have to change your keyboard to Arabic. You have to figure out what the key mappings are. You have to like do all of these things. And then like, 
So, I mean, I really guess the lesson is, and it's, it's, no, it's nobody's fault, it's just like, um, we need an Arabic speaker to really put, you know, like that's the user experience. An Arabic speaker needs to be putting this content in, but that's not the actual possibility. Um, I don't know if it's a JavaScript thing or if it's a UTF coding thing, because like, so I, I'll find out. I'll, I'll look into that. We got another Maybe question. Maybe it's also oh, an opportunity for us to engage the Drupal community in the Middle East, because I know that there are a lot of um, really active Drupal contributors in Egypt and other countries there, and maybe maybe this is the time for me to finally reach out to them and ask for their help and find out what they what solutions they've found to these kinds of problems. Yeah, definitely. Or just sharing the problems that I'm having. That would be yeah. helpful too. Yeah, there's Sounds a, like a bug there, to me. Sorry, go ahead. Sounds like a bug to me, and you could just post an, post an issue and. Someone might try to reproduce it and help you figure out how to fix it. Okay. I, I just wanted to address the translation management. There's actually a module called the translation management tool. And I haven't personally used it, but, uh, and this probably speaks to your running out of budget, sounds like, towards the end of the project. But I would definitely recommend anyone doing international websites to spend a lot of time thinking about the administrative interface and plan for a tool like this. Yeah. Um, there are other options like, uh, exporting uh, content f to be translated professionally, but that requires obviously a lot bigger of a budget. Um, the transma translation management tool allows for an a centralized interface and an, you can assign Drupal roles to be a translator. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually just have, it's sort of like an automated way uh, of using that spreadsheet, but it actually maintains the content in the context of the Drupal website. So nobody has to go through and copy and paste that content back into Drupal. It's just like yeah. a Drupal interface for yeah. translating the content in the website. I wish we had more money. Yeah, I've I haven't used the translation management module for D7. I used it in D6. It switched namespace. Okay. And I have never used it personally. Because what there was a company there was a. I can localize. I can localize was doing it. I used it at Medan for Drupal six, and it it worked. I think me, Dan, is actually working on their own translation management module. The th reason we didn't go with that on this project is because New Tactics only has one translator. And so to put a huge code base for one module for one translator, it just was a little bit overkill. And the user experience of that is a little wonky. And when I use it in D6, it's like a big, I can localize <laughs> logo. And um, I think their specific use case is hiring translators who, you know, there's there's a whole translator community where you can like, um, you can just work online and make like two cents a word or something like that. The, the new module, there's, a, there's a, an interface, there's two <coughs> ways of doing it. There's one where you can hire out your translations and then there's another one where you can just have an administrative interface within your site and assign a user a yeah. translator role. So Cool, uh, I'll check it out for D7. I just, most of the projects I've worked on didn't have like, you know, the the translation infrastructure of like managers and editors and stuff. But yeah, thanks, Jesse. Got another question? Could you talk just briefly about your approach to the low bandwidth uh, goal or objective? Uh, did, did you have a separate targeted site to cut down on images, or did you just make the focus on making the whole site super low bandwidth? Um. So, it, you know, we knew that there was low bandwidth. We knew that certain places in, like, so Jordan has really good high-speed internet. Beirut, Lebanon has good, I think it's download speed, but the upload speed is really slow. Uh, and so it, it changes everywhere. Um, I mostly tried to like just design it in a way that like didn't have like really really heavy background images um, for the body, and that you know I had certain ideas about if I was going to do the theme, but you know life happens. I got a new job, so I don't know. Brett, did you specifically build any of those things in? Um, you know, tried to leverage sprites where possible, but there's there's 
still a lot of easy instruments for conveying that, yeah. that route. I mean, the other thing to do is like, you can do different kinds of different uh, resolutions of images. The things I've done is on mobile sites, you just don't show the images. Um, right. There's different things you can do to like be like, you know, you can test what this bandwidth speed is. We didn't do that here, but right. yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm about to be working on a project uh, encompassing a lot of Africa, so I know yeah. it's gonna be a huge issue. Yeah. Another thing is like, don't, w like web fonts adds extra, st extra um, download. Anything that's gonna, like a jQuery, that if you're like pulling that in from Google, like external URLs, you just wanna limit those kind of things. Like, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm working with the site um, and it's multilingual. We have to translate the content in seven different languages. Wow. And uh, I'm having a problem like um, I have, uh, I figure out the way how to translate the menu items. We did that, we, we are just, I mean, we just launched the site as a beta version and uh, we are working in a dev to translate the content. Uh, can you tell me how do you manage the taxonomy? Like uh, when you define a content type and reference the taxonomy on the content type, like did you actually translate the content type, sorry, uh, taxonomy term, or did you, be, did you uh, add a different taxonomy term for different languages? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I think there's a taxonomy translation module um, I'm not sure, Kristen, did, are you using the same taxonomy terms for Arabic and English? We are, well, hmm. Like are the, are the terms, you know, if one yeah, term identical. is strategy, are you exactly yeah. translating that yeah. to strategy? Um, I believe so, but it, there could be a few that were set up a little bit differently. Um, like country, for example, that we're using a taxonomy term for country mm -hmm. um, or vocabulary for country. And so each country has a direct translation into Arabic. That was really simple. But there were a couple vocabularies that we're using that didn't have that one-to-one -one where we wanted to allow for some Arabic terms that would exist just on the Arabic site and some English terms just on the English site. Um, but I'm pretty sure we implemented that way, but I can't think of an example of how we're using that. But another thing maybe to point out is that our site isn't a one-to-one -one translation for all of our content. We can have nodes, conversations, comments that, are, that just live on the Arabic site, and we can have content that just lives on the English site. Um, that was something that we hadn't mentioned. Yeah. And another thing I would say, I mean, this is where tra tran multilingual sites get really, really confusing. Yes. And I really like it because it's a challenge. But a lot of developers I talk to, they're like, well, I'm not even gonna mess with multilingual. But I think it's really important to look at the use case. Like, you know, are your users um, bilingual? Do they speak multiple languages? Would it be helpful to show specific taxonomy terms in one language, but also show the English or another language? Um, you know, what would, would that hurt the user experience if there is not a one-to-one -one translation? Like maybe there's one term in one language that actually doesn't translate. Um, so I don't know if Drupal does multilingual taxonomy terms that well. But it I doesn't because if you set it up that way, so there should be a one-to-one -one translation, but you don't enter that other translation, you'll see that there's an empty field if you're making, if you're displaying that field on the node. Now that I think about it, and yeah. we ran into that problem a few times. And you know, at Funny Monkey, we are thinking about doing. Uh, we do educational products, so we. I really want to get into the translation world. Uh, with the educational products. And the way we're starting to think about translation is not the way that Drupal is thinking about it. Not a one-to-one -one relationship, like you have this piece of English content and then you've directly translated it to this you know, Arabic content because they're both gonna change. And so the way we're thinking about it is you have this original content, you clone it. And then you say, okay, now I'm gonna make the language Arabic. And now they're two different entities and they're gonna exist on their own. And so 
entity translation, like doing field level translation kind of helps that so that if you're looking at a page in English, you can hit translate and you can see which fields have been translated. But I still think it's like, if I only speak Arabic, I only want to see the content that's in Arabic. I'm not going to look, I'm not going to use the language switcher. So I think like it just, it really actually, it's a content strategy thing again. It has to be relevant to the users that um, you're, you're hoping will read the content. Uh, did you use any fallback uh, cases? Like, for example, if we launch a site in English, we put every content and we don't have a content ready on Spanish and somebody click on the Spanish language, I mean, it's partially translated to Spanish. Yeah. So what will happen, like, uh, in the menu, menu items and content, is there a way that uh, we can, if it's not translated to English, to, uh, Spanish, can right. we just display in English? Yeah, entity, entity field, like field level translation will let you do that. So let's say you've done the title and the body, right? Yeah, if you've done the title and the body in Spanish, you can see those Spanish terms, yeah. There is a possibility, I say you show the content in source language, mm -hmm. just not to say that this is what I charge you. Right. Or you can say redirect or say like the page is not found, mm -hmm. or redirect somewhere else. For example, if you have, you can redirect to the landing page, charge page in that language. Which I honestly, I think is all kind of hacky. Like what does the user really want? You know, like let's say I only speak Spanish and I come to this page, am I gonna be satisfied to read a title and a description when really what I want is that PDF download? You know, so it's like, is it even helpful to have a Spanish toggle on that page? Like probably shouldn't even have it. You know, unless you think your user might be able to read both languages. Okay, my other question is, did you use the, int, uh, like, uh, did you use the node, tra node translation or int entity translation? Because um, I found that node uh, entity translation, you'd have to translate every field in the content type. And there is separate uh, user interface for translating con like every field. So is that what you did or? I, I wasn't involved in the development. I know that they used entity translation. Do you have any? We don't have the person who did the back-end like development here. Adding, uh, when you're adding content, will you, will you say that this is for English heading, this is for Spanish heading, this is for Arabic heading? Yeah. Did you have to say that or, I mean? Uh, Kristen, when you're adding content, so you have an English node, when you want to make it Arabic, you, you're just translating via the fields, right? Well, there's a translation tab like you would expect, and then you see the entire back end of the node just as it is in English, actually, and it's all in Arabic. So there's the title, there's the body, there's the taxonomy terms, there's the publishing options. Everything is there in Arabic. So I don't know how that was built on entity translation because it looks like it's the entire node being translated, yeah. but I'm not sure. I think that's the node translation, not the entity translation. Yeah. When you say Entity translation, that field has to be translated with the, uh, uh, via translation interface. Yeah, it does sound like, it does sound like no translation. I'm not sure because I wasn't there during the development, but uh, I can follow up with the developer and Did get you have any problem with uh, like uh, translating views in different languages? Because yes. <laughs> views. Yeah, when yes. you put the views yes. on the page, how did you handle the, like, when you add the page, if somebody is check on different languages and you were supposed to render the same page in different, different languages. So th this specific website, like the Arabic content didn't match up, like is totally different content than oh. the English content. So they were different views, but yeah, you're right. There is a problem. Like Drupal is not a perfect multilingual <laughs> solution. I think we do what we can and you know, like, yeah. Okay, so there's a there's a module called Views Translation. So all labels and stuff are named, and then you can say okay, which fields you want to have in which field, and then you go the back end and say which which labels you want to have. Mm. I, I've done it. 
do you have any experience with the uh, surge? Like, what about surge? Like, we are using solar surge, and that surge <laughs> has to be translated. Like, we have 10 different microsites we are combining into one site and yeah. translating into different, like, seven different languages. Right. No, no, no fits. It's all real content and all landing pages. Thank you. Yeah, i sorry I don't have all the answers. It's It starts to get really, really complicated. And like when you throw solar search in there and then you're supporting seven different languages and then you have to have like... The no, I have no experience with the solar. I did a site in D6 with Apache solar search and we had to get a bunch of add-ons to like support the specific language and with the database and to make sure that, you know, I'm not, I'm not a back-end developer, so I don't know all of the details, but it was a process. It's not straightforward and um, yeah. So I feel your pain, but I think it's possible. And like, I mean, this is this is the great thing about the internet is that like, it's global. We're all speaking different languages. You know, it's possible, like, I'm really inspired by Global Voices um, website because they're doing a really good job of translation. They're doing the best they can. They're using WordPress, I believe. <laughs> they're on WordPress. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. So I, when I'm trying to think about translation, I go and I'm like, okay, how are they doing it? Global Voices on, is it globalvoices.org, Global Voices Online? Oh, yeah. Global Voices Online. Global Voices Online. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I actually had a question to Suzanne. Kristen. Kristen, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm having a really uh, hard time hearing. Yeah, can you talk right into the microphone? Uh, Kristen, when you refer to English site or Arabic site, what do you mean? Hmm. Okay, because it's all one big site. It's so interesting because with my team, my new tactics team, I always talk about it as if it, there's an English site and an Arabic site, but really it is all the same site. Yeah. What I mean is that there's a community of Arabic speakers okay. that are able to go to straight to the Arabic website. Now, if their browser is set to Arabic, it will automatically show up in Arabic in their browser and they're able to search and explore all of our resources that are in Arabic and there's a lot and they're able to participate in a community in the Arabic language. So it's like, it's as if it's its own thing. It's like its own platform. And then the English speakers would participate in the English okay. community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion. It's all one site. <laughs> Which was part of a, you know, a user experience problem we had to solve. It was like, okay, we're going to have Arabic users going onto the same site, but they only speak Arabic, but maybe they'll be bilingual, but we really just want to, them to participate in the Arabic conversations. It's not like we're having one conversation that gets translated. It was, we're having two separate conversations. Any other questions? Yes. So the question was a timeline question. Uh, she asked, we, we published the English in December and just, oh. and, in, and then recently the Arabic one. We started develop, or we started the user experience process, uh, can you refresh May. my brain? May. I think it was May. In May. Or April. And the, I left ThinkShout in October, so, but, but development had already begun before I left. So I was finishing up the research. We had already started the development. Brett came on and did the theming. So from October to December, they finished up the English site. So yeah. And by finishing up the English site, yeah. I just mean that the website was live and we hid the Arabic button. So it's not like we launched one site and then another site. That's another confusing part on my and it's that we just didn't, we just didn't make public the Arabic button. Yeah. Yep. You're welcome. Well, thanks everybody for coming and stay, sticking around at the very end of the day. And uh, 
you can find me on Twitter at, at Andrea Burton. And if you have any more questions, uh, New Tactics is at New Tactics on and Twitter. At KJ Anton. And at KJ Anton. And do you want me to say your Twitter? You're not much of a Twitterer. Okay. Thank you. Everybody have a great conference. Thanks for Thanks coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have fun in Portland. Thank you, Tristan. Yep, thank so, you. Awesome. I'll, we'll catch up soon, okay? Okay. Bye. Bye. Have fun. Thanks.